What's going on, Rhino Nation? Welcome to the Saturday live call. My my uh, camera looks terrible. Let me see if I can fix this right now. All right, we're having a few technical difficulties. Just bear with us this this morning. All right, I'm going to turn that camera off. Waiting for the rest of the coaches to join. If they don't make it, it's we will just start answering questions. Oh, Lauren's on. Can you hear me, Lauren? Mike check. Mic check. Hold on. I can't hear you. Let's see. Audio. Oh, man. We're just going to have a wonderful, wonderful time here. Um, let's see. Let's go. Come on. Hey, I can hear you, Chris Craddock. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. You look like right. you're in the witness protection program, though. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> I'm actually at a hotel in Tampa. Really, it's terrible, terrible video here. We can't hear you, Lord. Oh, man. Hey, progress, not perfection, right? Progress, not perfection. Um, Always. If, give me thumbs up. Are you hearing me, Chris? All right. Anybody hear Lauren? I'm not hearing Lauren. Nope. Nope. All right. Well, keep, you keep look all pretty now. We can see your face. It's all good. Oh, you got to stay closer to that camera or you lose or uh, we can't see you. You're witness protection. <laughs> all right. It's probably because I got this background. So let me, let me see if I can uh, change this a little bit. Spin it around here. That's what I get for trying to do this in a hotel room. There you go. Boom. All right. That'll work. That'll work. I'm just going to get rid of this mic. Um, let's start, uh, you know, just looking into some questions and answers here while Lauren gets on the audio. What's going on, Chris? Where are you at in the country today? I literally just got home. I flew in on a red eye from San Francisco. I was actually speaking at a our church men's breakfast. So I flew in, went and spoke of that and uh, got a quick like half hour nap and then uh, um, on here. But I will say this, uh, red eyes are so much better on in first class than they are the other way. So you like when you can like lay out the seat and everything. So I'll tell you that was uh, better. But man, I don't know that test, I want to keep red eyes. Yes, can Lauren. You hear, hear Lauren. Okay. So microphone it's just use I, I can just use my computer so sorry That's all right. my sound suck yeah you, you sound it, great it sounds perfect I, my regular mac uh camera today and mic because okay. none of my technology is working here either so heck with it progress not perfection we're gonna make sure we start answering some questions start giving value immediately and i'll fire off the first one guys just so you know there is going to be a giveaway today. There's going to be a giveaway. You are going to get access to the to the very first, well, actually you're going to be one of the first students of Wholesaling 101 taught by Lauren and Lauren Hardy and David Dodge. So Woo! what you're going to why do to there, win? Why is What's that? Stuck like that? I was going to say, why is it's my not face stuck. stuck like that? It's it not stuck. It's stuck just stuck you? on your end. No, it's Good. it's just on your end. <laughs> so, uh, so, okay. to win, to win one of the very first seats in the wholesaling 101 course, you just have to comment today wholesale 101. And don't worry, you do not have to spell wholesale right. It's okay. I still have a hard time spelling wholesaling, and and I've done over. 500 transactions at this point. <laughs> so just put in the comments, Wholesale 101. We're going to enter you into a drawing. Um, there we go. Dustin Matthews, first up. Let's go. Let's go. All right. So I see the comments are coming in. So keep putting them in. We're going to pick someone out of the drawing. And also, just so everyone knows, this is live comments. So you can actually ask questions here live today. And we want to make sure we answer as many questions. We're going to be on here for the next 54 minutes. Just bringing so welcome to the to the uh, Rhino Nation live Rhino table and Lauren, how are you today? Where where are you calling in from? In the world? oh, I'm calling from Huntington Beach. I'm uh, in the office today. 
Things are All good. Right. It's a good day. It's nice. It's sunny. Can't complain. I love it. I love it. And I'm in Tampa, Florida at a Pete Fortunato uh, seminar. Very, very interesting. Uh, my, my brain has been broken already, as Brent Daniels would say. Uh, and I've only been in the seminar a couple hours. I've already met a couple people. Um, doing possibly going to do some deals together. It's expanding my land business. Um, so I'm super excited. And as soon as this is over, I'm going to get back down there. Um, should we go ahead and start answering some questions, guys? Yeah, let's do it. All right. I got the questions right here. Um, Scarlett, I don't know if you can throw it up on the screen, but I have I have not pre-read pre these, so I'm going to be reading these, and we're just going to fire away. What is the best platform to pull accurate, tired landlord, absentee, pre-foreclosures, et cetera, list? Prop stream or batch? Lauren, you want to take the first stab at this? Yeah. So I don't like uh, real straight, easy answers. I always have to go <laughs> into the. I always have to go into the details and the science of this. So I personally love PropStream for all my list. I've been using it for so long. I'm a creature of habit, so I still use PropStream. And they were recently acquired by a really large company, so their data is only getting better. So when it comes to list pulling, that's where I pull my list. But you had a couple different types of lists, and I want to explain something. So when you're getting data from third-party providers like Batch, PropStream, uh, CoreLogic, like ListSource, all of that, sometimes the real niche lists are not available in your area. And you might, it might look like you're pulling a list, but that list isn't exactly the true number of, say, pre-foreclosures in the area. But as far as a um, absentee owner list, that is like the easiest for third-party providers to pull. And I love, that is my favorite list of all time is the absentee owner list. So PropStream is my go-to place for that list. I love it. Chris, did, did you have a, another opinion, another preference, any other options out there? I mean, I think what Lauren was sharing is, is awesome. I mean, I, you know, yeah, I, I, I would, I don't have much to add to that. I think what Lauren said is, is pretty much nailed it. I love it. Yeah. I, I second prop stream. I absolutely love prop stream. I also use priced P R Y C D, um, as well. And if you use priced.com forward slash T L S the land sharks, you can get 400 records for free. Um, but that's just, it's basically, it's all coming from the same database uh, so I go back and forth between priced and prop stream. So prop stream is definitely my favorite. I'm not familiar with batches uh, list, so I, I can't really uh, show. I, I haven't. I don't have experience with that. So all right, Graydon, nice to see you. I see you in the chat, man. Keep crushing it. All right, next question is from James and Brian. Thanks for asking that question, by the way. Next question is from James. I believe it's James Hunt. How can I get started in wholesaling? With absolutely no money, is there a way? Um, I, I really can't wait to answer that one because I was that guy in 2016. But if if uh, Chris, you you kind of look like you don't have any money. Do you want to you want to answer that one? <laughs> Thanks, brother. I I'm just kidding. Hey, we're here I'll to give each what, other. Our after money. flying in on that, uh, like I feel like I could be like living in a corner somewhere with a <laughs> with a jar right now, man. I'm hurting. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, so. You know, I, I would just say the the fastest, easiest, or the easiest way was zero dollars. Obviously, if you go to Deal Machine, there's you know there's you know there's stuff that you can do on Deal Machine uh, to do driving for dollars. Even Batch has has options there. Uh, but if you have zero dollars, then you know what I did when I first started. Like I mean, this was in 2003 when I first uh, flipped my first couple of houses. Was I just went to the doors and knocked on them, and uh, so I didn't actually like pull any data or anything else, but I'll tell you just for a few bucks, you can, uh, you can pull some data. Um, but if you have like $0, like absolutely $0, then you, uh, you can go knock on doors of, of properties that look like they're out of place, you know, dilapidated, don't fit the neighborhood value. Um, you know, I've got one, you know, kind of, I drive past every day and, uh, 
you know, I just, I had my uh, assistant skip trace it. And somebody told me that, uh, that the person they called is like owns a remodeling company. And I'm like, wait, they own a remodeling company and their house looks like that. But yeah. So anyway, that made me, me laugh, but it just stuck in my brain. Cause every day I drive past it and I'm like, oh my gosh, this house is just so beat up. And I was like, okay, I just gotta, we gotta buy this house. <laughs> That's amazing. Lauren, I know it's been a long time uh, since you haven't had any money, uh, but let's, <laughs> let's, can you remember those days just getting started with, with little, no money, or maybe you had a little money, but just think if you didn't have any money, how would you have gotten started for James? Oh, no, uh, I still remember being pretty poor, actually. Um, I started when I was 25 years old. And uh, I used to shop at the dollar store for my groceries, you know, so I remember I'd go and say, I can spend, I could get 20 things for $20. Like, and that's what I would do, spend, go to the, you know, the dollar store. I love dollar stores, by the way. <laughs> so yeah, I had no money. Um, I'm not sure if you, if, if this is the smartest recommendation, but I'll tell you what I did. So I started, I got my marketing budget. So I started indirect mail, which is expensive. And I put it all on a credit card. <laughs> so uh, not sure if I would recommend that. It is It is not the, probably the smartest thing to do. Dave Ramsey would tell you you're crazy. But I just believed within my soul that I was going to flip a house and I was going to earn that money back. So that's what I did. 1010 don't recommend it though. Pretty risky, okay? But I'm just being candid with you. The other thing that you can do, Chris already talked about just door knocking, which is totally free, is you could maybe get into disposition co-wholesaling where you work with another wholesaler and you help them move their contracts. Building a buyer's list can be done for free. So you can build a massive buyer's list with just your time. And then you can network with all the wholesalers in the area that are doing seller marketing, spending a ton of money and say, hey, I'll help you move your deals and work something out with them. So that's it. Oh, I no. love it. I love it. Just to tag so, on to what Lauren said, there's this kid in my uh, in my uh, area that's doing just that. I mean, he's and I say a kid. I mean, literally, he was in high school, and he was just doing that. And I mean, I was so I've been so impressed by this kid because he's like literally just tagging on and then finding buyers for stuff and making money. I mean, I'll tell you, it, it's never a lack of resources. It's always a lack of resourcefulness. So. Yeah, when Lauren said that, I thought about that kid in my in my market because, like, literally, the kid just impresses me all the time, and I'm like, man, I love it. Hopefully, yeah, did you I, guys catch what I said? I heard my audio is choppy. Can the uh, yeah? Hopefully, you guys got that. <laughs> yeah, it all came through. It was just a little bit choppy and like sca like scratchy. Um, I don't know what's what's going on, but it just started out as soon as you started talking about the no money. Um, and, I, and I want to further expand on the wholesaling with absolutely no money because there's so many ways to do it. And I remember starting out with no money. A lot of my mailings did go on credit cards. And it's funny, you know, even after I did some deals, I ran out of money very quickly and I still had to put it on credit cards. So there's been times where I, I was already getting started and I ran out of money. Uh, so and I had to do it on credit cards. But there's also other people out there that want to get on board with, with on a speeding train. So you don't have to think about it all alone. You could partner with someone that maybe has a little bit more money but less time. Uh, there's also ways to to create partnerships just on a mailing, you know, where, where someone else pays for your mail and you just split the deals. There's also ways to bring in, you know, or actually save money by canceling things like Netflix and Hulu and the little things like our pool service, our lawn service. Like what can you cut out that's costing you money each month or each week that you could then put that into mailing or paying for drive or deal machine like driving for dollars app and actually driving for dollars kind of like like Chris had just mentioned. So there's so many ways to do this without any money. There's going to meetups in real estate investor associations that are usually free and finding the guys that are actually buyers and finding what they're looking for. My first two wholesale deals 
came from getting that seven-day free trial to PropStream. This was back in 2013. I had to pay for some college classes. But I pulled up the Liz Pendens list, the notice of default. And I went back like three months. And I pulled up every person that was behind on their mortgage. And I went and knocked on the door. And the people that weren't home, thank God, because every time someone opened the door, I felt like they, <laughs> they were either really mad or they played for the NFL. Uh, but I got, I got more and more nervous as I knocked on these doors and my knocks got lighter and lighter and I started leaving these beautiful handwritten post-it notes saying, hey, I'm not with the bank. I'd like to buy your house. Call me. And guess what someone did? And that first deal turned into a second deal because another wholesaler saw my ad on Craigslist, me trying to wholesale this property and thought I was some successful wholesaler and thought I had a buyer's list. And she called me about her deal. And guess what? That same buyer that bought my first deal bought that second deal. So it's just getting out there and taking action. And I didn't have a lot of money. I just had to spend the gas money in the seven-day free trial to PropStream. So there's so many ways to get started. All right. Kermit Rice is asking, what's your thoughts on video retargeting on Facebook? Anybody doing, doing that here? Oh. I don't even know what that is. I just know what Facebook ads are. So I've done Facebook ads for my real estate investing uh, business and wholesaling business. And I could be on, to be honest, I didn't have the best success with it. Uh, we did close a couple deals, but for how costly it was, it kind of was break even. So I'm not a big fan of Facebook ads, but I'm sure there are people that like, probably kill it it just i didn't do very well with it so i got a funny story about this i'm looking at my kpis for land sales and i'm looking that we spent like it was so it's, it was a crazy amount of money this was a couple years ago probably about a year and a half almost two years ago maybe we had spent like 300 dollars on facebook but we had sold a little over i think it was like thirty nine thousand worth of of land and I was like, what is this Facebook charge? Facebook Marketplace is free. Facebook buy sell groups are free because that's how we sell our land, a lot of our land. And my marketing director that sits in the Philippines, she said, no, it's for our Facebook retargeting ads that Brandon Bateman does. Uh -huh. And I was like, holy cow. We spent roughly like 300 bucks to bring in over 40 grand worth of land sales. So I love Facebook retargeting. We now do it for our house business as well. So basically what Facebook retargeting is for anybody in the audience is if they come to my land sales website, like getland.org, or they come to my, my house buying website, they are now are pixeled basically. Their IP address, I don't know how it works completely, but they're basically, they get a little pixel. And now when they go on social media, mostly Facebook, we pay like a penny or two and they see a video of me or one of my buyer, my acquisition managers or my land sales specialist. They see a video of us talking about land or talking about selling their house. So they always see us basically as long as they're on Facebook. And it costs us like pennies every single time that video comes out. So I absolutely love Facebook retargeting. I don't do it myself because I'm not, a, I'm not good at tech. But it's, it's very inexpensive marketing. Yeah. How about you, Chris? Are you doing any of that? Uh, we do a little bit of uh, retargeting. Um, I think that it's, you know, I think it's it's really interesting when, you know, I personally will see that somehow I'll get in some, somebody's funnel and I feel like I've got like a stalker ex-girlfriend wherever I go, like that face is right in front of me and uh, I'm like, oh man, I can't get away from it. But um, But it is interesting. The first time I ever experienced that was years ago when I was looking at buying some golf clubs and everywhere I went, online um you know some golf clubs were popping up around me and you know i ended up buying some golf clubs right and and all of a sudden i realized the power of of the subliminal subliminal you know hitting you know just over and over and over again and so there is some power to it um obviously i i don't know that that would be my number one uh place to spend money i think that um if you know, I think that's a good add on and like a second tier strategy, I think. Uh, but yeah, I do think that it is a it is powerful for sure. I love it. And I agree. Most people don't wake up 
I tell my team this every day. Most people don't just wake up today and want to buy land. They're going to come to our website or they're going to see us on a, on a Craigslist ad or see our sign. Then go to our website, check it out. Maybe check out our land inventory. And then they're going to see like 10 videos from me talking about land and the benefits of owning land and how not to get scammed when buying land. And six months later, they finally go on and just press the buy now button. So it's the same thing with, with, with uh, house acquisitions, house sales. It all works together. Um, the next question is – actually, I'll come back to this question. I think, Lauren, you're improved. are you good with your audio? Because there's a question specifically for you. You want me to come back to Ooh, you? I don't know. Let, can you hear me? Still the same. It's still the same. Uh, I can hear you. It's just choppy, yeah. It might be – Lauren, I've, I've had that situation happen before. It might be worth signing off and signing back on. I'm going to try – you know what? I'm going to try that, okay? And then go on to the next questions, and then I'll come back to Oklahoma. All right. All right. So I'm going to drop down a couple. We'll circle back to the question from Brian Enox, Trinity Real Estate. Uh, and I'm going to go to Adam Thomas. How do you find buyers? How do you find buyers? So I assume maybe that's for houses. Uh, I don't know if that's for land. You want to take the first shot at that, Chris? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of, a lot of ways to buy, find buyers. Um, in my opinion, um, and this isn't what every, this isn't everybody's favorite opinion, but like my opinion is um, you're going to make the most money if you sell to people that are looking in the retail uh, retail space, because if you're selling to like your standard investor, you're, they're going to still want a discount, right? Where if you sell to somebody that's like a more retail buyer, then you're going to be selling at somewhere between 97 and 99 cents on the dollar. And they think they're going to get a great deal. Like you're, and I call that your civilian buyer. And so the way, in my opinion, I think the best way to do that is to hit the real estate agent groups, right? Because they all have buyers in different places. And so if you can get into like the different Facebook groups, the different places where real estate agents are hanging out and you can get your stuff posted in front of them, then they can get bu their buyers that are looking to pay retail. And if they get like, a couple percentage points off, they think they they have gotten the greatest deal ever for their clients. So that's the best way to do it. And a lot of times people are like, well, we can't do that with the wholesale fees or whatever. But the reality is if you put your wholesale fee on the seller's side of the Ulta, then you can you can sell it with a with a 30 year loan. So um, you make a lot more money, your spreads are a lot bigger, and uh, there's just so many more retail civilian buyers out there then they're then you're going to get the ones that want you know to shave a massive amount to get a great deal so that's my take i love it especially right now i mean you know a lot of these buyers are so sick and tired of having to compete with multiple offers and still losing out on the deal so imagine how to get the retail for your wholesale deal you know lower it a couple percent you might have to extend your contract with your seller but that's brilliant i love it how are you finding your buyers these days, Lauren? Can you hear me? Oh, so much better. That was great. Look at that. Okay. It was. It, I had to just log back in. <laughs> okay. And are you hearing this? Yes. Yeah. Good. You're okay. On. So now my mic works. Okay. So guys, y'all know if that happens again, just log back in. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, ask me the question again because I just totally, I think I missed how, part of it. Oh, how, how do, do I you find, find my Oh, okay. Fire. Yeah. So, um, you know, thinking just strictly on the wholesale side, my end buyers being landlord buyers or house flippers, um, we do a lot of different things. Um, we will pull lists like from prop stream, um, and we will send a mass text, you know, to all the people that like the cash sales that we can see, um, in the last year. And uh, we'll send a mass text. Are you still buying? I noticed you bought a property here. Are you, you know, still buying property? And I strike up a conversation and I add them to my buyers list. Um, I use Go Section Eight. That's a great website, GoSectionEight.com, and you'll find a bunch of landlord buyers. Um, I will. Uh, sorry, the screen just popped up and that just distracted me. <laughs> uh, what else do I do? You know, one way that we find buyers 
is when we already have a deal. So kind of having some bait to then find more, you know, you attract more buyers that way. So whenever we have a deal, we market it on all of the local um, real estate investment associations on Facebook. And that's a great way because you'll get people that go, you know, you've never met before that are now members of that group. And they say, Hey, I'm interested in that deal. And they reach out to you. Um, I also will look at anybody who posted in that group and I will reach out to the people that have posted on interest in other people's deals. So, um, all things that, you know, you can like do those things for free. Um, so that's how I'm doing it. I love it. I'm going to give this a shot too, because I'm, I'm going to focus on land first. And then I want to talk about how our house buying company is finding buyers, but the land side of things, I find that each market, we we find that the medium is a little different. Uh, a lot of some markets we sell land very well with signs. Signs do very very well. Some markets Craigslist has done very very well for us. But Craigslist it needs to be local. So if the property is in Colorado Springs or just on the outskirts, Craigslist wants us to post it in Colorado Springs or they'll ghost our ad. They'll basically take it down. Facebook Marketplace is working phenomenal in one of my markets in Florida. Uh, Facebook buy sell groups are working really well. Another spot is neighbor letters, literally sending the neighbor of the adjoining property. So for instance, I own uh, this property and then there's three other parcels that touch mine or adjacent parcels, sending a letter to them and then texting them, seeing that they'd be interested in buying that parcel of land has worked phenomenal for us. Um, land.com. I think I mentioned all of them. Uh, those are most of the places we're finding buyers for our land. Um, and, you, and you might be thinking, holy crap, I don't want to have to market on all those platforms. Well, let me tell you, until you build a massive cash buyers list of people just salivating for your land deals, you have to do that. And then eventually you'll be like, okay, well, Craigslist doesn't work and signs don't work, but but uh, Facebook Marketplace does really well. And so does uh, the neighbor letters in this one particular area. So you'll get there. And then for our house side of our business, you know, I, I love what Chris Craddock said. We're looking for the people that will pay the absolute most. So we'll we'll buy the house, renovate it, and fix it, and then put it on, on the MLS. We're trying to keep more of them lately for tax purposes, um, and then trading up to bigger parcels of land, mostly just so we can save money, so that we don't have to send as much money to the IRS. Uh, but when we're looking for buyers, you know, some of the ways we do it is we go to the auctions. We we go to the auctions and hand out a flyer for the parcel or for the property that we're gonna do an inspection period on for our wholesale properties. So they just went to this bloodbath and they paid 107% of retail value uh, because they went to the auction. And then they get your little flyer and immediately after the foreclosure auction, they can come look at your wholesale deal through their inspection period. They have two hours, they can check it out, they're not gonna be forced and they can make the highest and best offer. That's how we get some of our best buyers uh, for, for our house deals. Um, other ways are just going on PropStream and looking up the cash buyers of the cash transactions that just happened in the last couple months. So collectively, we've given you about 10 ways, 20 ways to find buyers, right? <laughs> yeah, love it. All yeah, right, and, and I just want to be clear, you don't actually have to put it on the ML, own it and put it on the MLS. You can go in agent, like agent groups and just post that you have something in, in a certain neighborhood and any, and people with buyers will want to connect with you and you can get like retail buyers in, into that by just partnering there. So I just want to make sure that I was, I was clear on that. No, that's awesome. Thanks for clarifying that. All right. Let's go back to Brian Enoch's question with Trinity real estate. This question is for Lauren. I heard about your success with Real Estate Masters TV on your Wholesaling Inc. interviews, and it's been, hold on, let me scroll over so I can read the rest of it, and it's been on my mind for a year now, so after closing on a big deal we did recently, I signed up and we filmed. I don't know what his question was. I think he was just sharing a win. So, Lauren, it looks like Brian Enoch signed up with Real Estate Masters TV. Congrats, Brian. Well, hey, Brian. Can Oh yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So it's, uh, I know you, Brent, you cut out a little bit. So his end question was any advice if it doesn't work quickly? Um, I do have some advice. If it doesn't work quickly, um, don't throw good money at bad. So TV is very, very expensive. And if you're spending 10 grand a month 
six months can go by really quick and you just spent 60 grand on something that's not working for you. TV, in my experience, I've did it in two different markets. One did extremely well. The other did not. And there was this feeling of, well, maybe I'll give it one more month. And then maybe I'll give it one more month after that. And it didn't work as well. And, you know, in the end, I kind of wish I would have quit a little earlier. Um, so one way to kind of gauge how your TV channel is going to do is maybe see how many commercials are out there already. It's hard for me because I'm virtual. So I'm not I can't turn on daytime television and see my commercial. So it was a little bit of a trial and error to see what markets it worked better in than others. But I did have an experience. I'm just being honest, transparent. Um, it works better in some markets than others. So highly recommend if it's been about three months and, and you've not really gotten a contract or anything from it, you might want to try something else. I love it. I love it. Hey, Chris, what were you saying there? Oh, I was just saying we, uh, now that Lauren's back, we might want to go back to that Oklahoma uh, question, the wholesaling and, uh, and all of that. Yes. That we were gonna hit. I don't have access to the questions anymore because I had to log off. So can someone ask it? <laughs> sure. Yeah. They were just asking, um, you know, is, are you still working in Tulsa? Um, you know, is, is wholesaling illegal? Is it not illegal? What are the guidelines? And oh. yeah, man. No, okay. Talking. You know, Dustin, let me tell you, just yesterday, I'm reminded why in Oklahoma, they started enforcing these laws because there are some shady wholesalers that are really putting a bad name out there for wholesaling. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of funny business in Oklahoma. And that's why they, you know, they started tightening up the belt. So is wholesaling illegal no, it is not illegal in Oklahoma, but they have now made it illegal to publicly market your deals that you just have equitable interest in versus actually owning it and being on title. So from the last attorney consultation I had, there is still the debate of what is considered public marketing. And that's important. So is public marketing putting it on the internet, on your website where anyone in the public can see it? Is it posting it on Facebook, you know, in a Facebook real estate group that isn't a private group? That could probably be considered public marketing. And if I were you, I would not do that. Um, however, some very well-networked wholesalers like myself who have a very private list of investors from what I'm being told by an attorney and I'm not giving legal advice, but I am being told that that there is still a gray area on that, that I can discuss this opportunity I have with a private list of investors and I can still as legally assign my contract. So that's where the law stands right now. What I've been told by my attorney as well is that they are going to start tightening up the language, defining what public marketing is. Um, but to my knowledge, that's not been done yet. Yeah. And one, one thing I'll add to it is there's a lot of states that are, are going after it, especially mm -hmm. after um, and we, and we see, you know, NAR, National Association of Realtors, became aware of this with, uh, uh, with the sale of PropStream and realizing that there was some data that was not, you know, PropStream had to jump through hoops. So there's five states that are working on it now. And I think it's going to be across all 50 states where people are going to have to get licensed as real estate agents um, in order to wholesale. Um, so I do believe that getting getting ahead of that is really important, which is why we at Wholesaling Inc. have come together to, to create a community. Um, if you are licensed now, um, you know, some, some extra access to some of the coaches, some of the materials, some of all of all the different things we can do to help. And if you want to get licensed, you know, reach out to us and we can help you get licensed, get access to um, what we're working on here. But I do believe that this is, is going to be coming in, in all 50 states at some point. Um, the National Association of Realtors is <clears throat> one of the most powerful lobbies in the country. And they, they're going to be bringing that. And also, let's be honest. I mean, 
there are a lot of wholesalers, like Lauren said, that just give wholesaling a bad name and mm -hmm. have kind of brought this on ourselves a little bit. So, um, so yeah, anyway, I, I would say it's really important to kind of start getting up in front of it. Like, I mean, Michigan is one of the places you, if, if you do more than five wholesale deals in Michigan, you need to be licensed. Michigan doesn't enforce this right now, but one day they are going to enforce it. And if you're in Michigan and you're the person that all of a sudden they pick to enforce it on, you don't want to be their enforcement poster child. That's like the scary thing. And you don't want it to come through your state when, and then all of a sudden catch you by surprise. And then you have to go get licensed and all the other stuff. So, um, you know, what is it? Wayne Gretzky said he was the greatest because he didn't sk skate to where the puck was, but to where the puck was going to be, this is where the puck's going to be. Mm -hmm. That's why I've already enrolled in the Florida licensing course. Yeah, oh. I'm like, and I'm licensed. So I joined EXP and Chris helped me a lot with, with signing up with EXP. And we, you can definitely reach out to us and learn more about that opportunity because I thought, you know, that I had to find a local brokerage, like in California, you know, and put my license under them. And it, and I just, I really didn't know where to go. And then Chris taught me about this, you know, virtual brokerage called EXP. And I'm like, well, I'm virtual. So doesn't that make a lot of sense? Um, and I discovered that, you know, there's a lot that we can do, you know, as the biggest game changer, like Chris told me on a call, I am in a virtual market that I'm not licensed in. I'm licensed in, in California. But I'm in, you know, Pennsylvania, I'm in Oklahoma. And I told Chris, I said, I think maybe I want to get like my license in Pennsylvania so then I can like start, you know, listing some of these properties that don't quite work for a wholesale, but would be a great listing and I can still monetize my TV ad lead, you know? And Chris said, uh, Lauren, uh, that's not really a great use of your time. Did you know that you don't have to do that? You just have to partner with someone who has their license. So Chris, why don't you tell me a little bit of more, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that because a lot of people don't realize that like that you can just partner with someone who has their license. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the cool thing is, you know, I'm licensed in DC or DC, Virginia and Maryland, but you know, Brent gets his license in, uh, Brent gets his license in Florida. And if I get a deal down in Florida or have something going on in Florida, I can just call Brent up and get him or somebody on his team to list it. And, and Brent would pay me, you know, usually the standard fee for a real estate agent is 25%. So if I send him something that's like worth like 350, he makes 10 grand in commission on it. He'll pay me $2,500 just as like, that's just what's standard. And I'm not licensed there. I don't do anything except pass it on to Brent. And so that's where it's really, really powerful to uh, to have a license and you you can literally do it anywhere. And that's why EXP is, you know, just a great, a great tool because it's a virtual brokerage, you know, license anywhere. And um, and then they really, really incentivize. They make it so that, um, you know, if, if you help people, which is why, like Lauren's saying, she signed up. So, you know, if you're in Lauren's, like tribe, right? Which we all are in each other's tribe, right? Then, you know, Lauren's incentivized to, to help you succeed. It, it really is cool how they, how they modeled that uh, virtual brokerage. So instead of like a boots on the ground broker owner, you know, you have people that are, are incentivized to help. So wouldn't this hurt that FISBO? Uh, so you are still allowed to sell your own property. So if you own it, right? Then you have to close on it, which would be not wholesaling, but either wholesaling or fix and flipping. You can do that. Um, the problem is selling it with, like Lauren was saying, the equitable interest, right? Where you you have the contractual rights. And this is just to get into the weeds just a, a bit. What they're saying is um, you will need to have that. It used to be like the equitable interest is just, just that. You're selling the contract but what these states are saying is if you are selling a real estate contract that you are now doing licensed real estate activity, which is a crime in states. If you try to sell a house or sell real estate without a license, it's a crime. And so they're making it a crime. So it's a very serious offense when they get you for, you know, selling real estate without a license and you don't want to be, you don't want to be there, but you can sell your own real estate without a license. 
All right. Uh, so Donna Perry, just going back one question. What is RE Masters TV? Basically, it's real estate masters TV. Uh, so base, and, and I'll let uh, Lauren explain this a little bit more if, if you'd like. This is a, a, a program that teaches you how to get on TV, how to monetize it, how to film it, what to say, who to use to film it, who to buy your TV ads. Did I miss anything, Lauren? And yeah. I think you have a you actually have a, a link to to get there, right? I do, I do. So just look up, um, you know, Real Estate Masters TV with Tony Javier on Google. And let him know Lauren Hardy sent you. He'll give you $1,000 off, I think, your first month um, of your ad spend um, if you let him know that you came from me. Um, Tony is um, hes essentially my ad buyer, if you think of it like that. Um, if you try to go you know, on this on your own, you're not going to really know like what channels to put your commercial on and even how to negotiate your ads with networks. So Tony handles all of it for me. I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do was film my commercial. Um, the best part about it too is that Co Tony will film your commercial if you don't want to do it. Um, but hey, I wanted to be on TV. So um, yeah, that's that's who handles all my ads. I mean, just it was nice right off the shelf. He did everything. I didn't have to do anything but film my commercial and just work my leads. I second that. Uh, Tony's course was amazing. I mean, I, he didn't really even need to, to do the course because it was really done for me. Um, yeah. I did film my ads. I got a lot of phone calls from people saying, hey, I saw you on TV. Uh, but we did change it up to where my acquisition managers now film it rather than me uh, because I wasn't the one going to see the sellers. So why not have the person that's on TV be the person that's coming to the door? So that's one change that we were making. Um, yeah, uh, Tony Javier has a great uh, program with that. All right, there were some more questions in the chat. Uh, from Graydon, three action steps to put a piece of land under contract if you had to today. Quick two to three bullet points. So first thing I would do is start my own backyard. Next thing I would do, I would get a list of hungry people that need to sell right now or at least some type of motivation. So there's a couple ways you can do that. This is number two, by the way, step two. Get that list. So you could go to the tax collector's office. In some states, is what they call that. Some states they call it the uh, the oh man, I just drew a blank. The county treasurer's office. You're basically looking for people that are behind on their taxes and not paying taxes. And I would look at that list, and I would mail every single person on that list a quick postcard or a letter saying, "Hey, I'd like to buy your land. If you're interested in a fair, no hassle offer, call me, text me. God bless you." and then get ready for the phone to ring. And if you really want to micro down that list and get the lowest hanging fruit on that list, I want you to pick the people that are behind on taxes and they live out of state. And let's just say that, oh my gosh, that sounds like too much work. Then go to floor, go to, then go to, let me just correct myself, then go to the inheritedlandlist.com, inheritedlandlist.com, and you can find people that inherited land in this country, uh, the, Pretty much anybody on this list, over 25% of those people will need and have to sell in the next 24 months. So that's step number two. And then I already mentioned step number three is send them a letter. So I don't know if that answered your question, Graydon, but that's the, the three quickest ways I would say to put a piece of land under contract right away. One, pick your area. Two, get a list of hungry people that need to sell their land right now. And three, send them a letter and wait for the phone to ring. All right. Tyler Hopkins asked, are y'all scaling back on Airbnb properties in wake of new proposed res restrictions? Or do you think there's still a lot of opportunity there? What do you think, guys? I don't well, do Airbnb. So I'm not an expert, but I had always wondered, you know, because I know I, I one of my markets was Nashville, Tennessee. And the hotels, you know, it, they were putting the hotels out of business. And the neighbors were getting real upset because there was a ton of Airbnbs in Nashville. So they restricted it where there's like a certain amount of licenses that the city will give to um, short-term rentals like that. Yeah. I, I would also say, I think there's also other, other factors as well where <clears throat> I think very special Airbnbs that are not in areas that 
you're seeing restrictions or places that you should go, but we're already seeing Airbnbs are slowing down regardless. You know, our, the Airbnbs we have now, we have a lake property that's kind of like a really nice lake property that um, we bought, not necessarily as much for the investment, but also so we could use it and have it kind of paid for. So we love that. But um, we're seeing even that slowing down. And a number of my other friends that are pretty heavy in Airbnb are, are sharing how their income is is slowing down dramatically now that the world is opened up again. And so that's just something to be aware of. Um, I think going strong into Airbnb may be something you should just really think about strongly before you just like go all in on it. Um, I, my recommendation is the same recommendation I make whenever you're looking to buy a property. You always, if you can buy at a massive discount, you know, you win when you buy, that's awesome. Uh, number two is, is the property special, right? Is there a reason why somebody would choose your property over another property? And if so, um, those are reasons to, to go into it. But you should also look and see HOA, municipality, other things that may be coming down on it. And if, if they are, then, you know, be very wary because no matter what you're getting it for, um, if you don't have a good exit strategy, you'll get yourself into trouble. Even if you don't want to exit, um, if for whatever reason you have to exit and you, you don't have a good exit strategy, you could get yourself into trouble and then it could hamstring your other business. I'm not heavy in Airbnbs. I only have one left currently and my family uses that as our own personal vacation rental that, that, you know, guests pay for basically. Um, it's funny, right before we got on this live show, I just texted my wife a property, a $1.8 million property in the Florida Keys. Uh, because we've been talking about that for years. Now, I wish we would have bought a couple in 2009, but uh, I didn't have the 2020 vision um, I do now of, of, you know, just looking back in the past. So I'm not heavy in it, uh, but I think capitalism is always going to work in the United States. I mean, we call it Airbnbs, but it's really a short-term rental, right? It's a vacation rental, or it could go to maybe a seasonal rental. There's other ways you can shift and pivot uh, you know, Airbnb just basically became the household name, kind of like Band-Aid for adhesive bandage. So like Chris said, you are, you're a little bit better than the other guy. And let's just say they do restrict it. You can have less and you're locked in. Well, no more competition can come in. You, you've got the stronghold there. And I don't buy in, for our Airbnbs. None of them have ever been in an HOA or a deed restricted area because I like that's probably the first that's probably the first place that's going to cut them out. The city I live in in Florida will not allow Airbnbs. So guess what? I'm not buying Airbnbs in my city. So, I mean, you can kind of look at it both ways, um, but I, I'm i not going to let that stop me, the proposed uh, restrictions for what we're, we're planning to do in South Florida. All right, let's see. Let's pull up the chat and get my screen to lower here. All right, let's see if we got any more that were submitted. Sure. Uh, well, Jack Owen asked, go ahead. I was going to say, while we're waiting on, uh, while we're looking at some of these other things, um, I'd love to just share a quick market update, what's going on with the economy and the real estate market, just according to data and everything else. Because I know a lot of people are, Please. are fearful about it. So um, this is something I spend a lot of time looking at all the time, just being in the retail world. I need to be talking to retail buyers and sellers. So I'll just share it like, take two minutes real quick and just share some of what's going on. So little history lesson, because if you don't, if you don't study history, you're doomed to repeat it. Right. There's never been a major, uh, a major, major real estate crash when inventory was really low going into it. Right. So the closest that we're seeing right now in our economy is uh, Jimmy Carter era stagflation, which means um, we're in, in inflation and the economy is stagnating. But even then, there was the real estate market had been suffering for a long time. And so right now we're going into something where the real estate market is still really tight. And I don't, I do believe there may be a slight correction just a little bit, but we're, I don't believe that we're going off a cliff for this reason. Um, from 08 to 18, um, the builders were building less than 20% of the houses that, that we needed nationwide to keep up with uh, new demand for purchases. And so with that said, um, 
you know, for all these different reasons. One, builders went out of business. Lenders were less likely to lend. Builders were more nervous about building, all these other things. It wasn't until really 2018, builders really started ramping up like crazy building. And so we're way behind on, on available inventory to sell. And we know that when there's not much available, that the prices tend to go up. So now because of interest rates going up like crazy, um, some of the buyers get priced out of where they were looking, but there were still so many buyers available that, uh, that were still in a very, very strong seller's market. And, you know, there's just not much, everybody needs a place to live. It's not like the stock market where everybody has to invest in the stock market. Everybody needs a place to live. And so because of inflation, um, uh, all the hedge funds and, and whatnot, they're still putting their money in real estate because real estate's a good bet against inflation. So real estate is still strong because that's where they're going to go. Where else are they going to put their money? The stock market? No, the stock market's terrible. You know, cryptocurrency, not good right now. So there's not really any other places other than gold and silver and commodities and real estate that people can put their, uh, their money and so that's why I believe that it's going to be strong here going forward. And we may see a little bit of a correction just because of the extreme, uh, you know, uptick in the last year or two, but I don't think it's going to be that much. So I just want to just give a quick minute on what's, what we're seeing. Well, I always love, I always no, appreciate so. Chris's market updates, especially with him coming from the uh, really heavy retail side, all the experience that Chris has, and he's got an office like full of agents. So, um, definitely Chris, you know what you're talking about. And can I just share like what I'm doing, you know, as an investor, um, you know, I, someone told me this once you can't time the market. You know, if you keep trying to time the market as an investor, you're going to like not do deals. And I made that mistake. Like in my career, there was a time that I thought that we were at the top. And so I slowed down a lot on flipping in 2019 and I dumbest mistake ever, because what happened in 2020, right? Like if I would have actually ramped up flipping, then I would have made a ton of money. Right. So I, I mean, now I'm like, yeah, you can't time the market. I'm still buying deals to flip and I'm looking and analyzing them right now at where the prices are right now. And I'm just making sure that I've got at least about a 15% buffer. So if say prices went down during my whole time, 15%, which that's a, that takes a long time for prices to go down that drastically. Like, I don't think in history they go, they've ever gone down that fast in say two, three, four months. Like, so, you know, my thinking is even if it did, I would still be in the green on the deal, or maybe I'm slightly in the red a few thousand bucks, but it's not like a hundred thousand dollars. Right. So like, that's how I'm buying right now is just making sure that, you know, I will be, you know, like in an okay place if, if prices did go down and also remember, like, I'm going to keep buying, like I'm so in six months, I'm still going to be a buyer and I'm just going to now buy better deals. Right. So I'm still going to end up doing okay. So it's like, you just kind of have to roll with the market. You're not timing the market and quitting and stopping and just sitting on the sidelines, but you can't do that or you won't make any money. Right. So you just got to keep rolling with the market um, but adjusting your numbers accordingly so you don't end up in the red. That's my two cents. Yeah, really good. And hey, last thing I'll leave it with is study data. Study the data. Look at the data because data is not trying to sell you anything. So just just be data driven. Sometimes you might be you might be like me. You don't want to look at spreadsheets and the data and read and all that stuff. Well, unfortunately, that's that's what we need to know in these markets and understand the data. All right, I think we got time for one more question here, and it's from Jack Owen. What's the difference between flipping and wholesaling, and what's better? Who's going right, to answer it? Who wants to answer? I'll answer well, Lauren, it. You're doing, Let's Lauren. Go, you're wholesaling one on one. You're the you're the expert wholesaling one on one. Let's hear it, Lauren. I'll do both. I'll and do let both. Me, let so me stand corrected. I called it the wrong. It's called the Rhino Roadmap. 
I apologize. I called it wholesaling 101, but Rhino Roadmap is the correct term for the course. I apologize. You know, I should know that, but we we actually, I don't even know if we decided officially on the name. And if, if we did and that's what it is, then that's news to me. That's great. <laughs> so don't worry. Um, we, okay, so the difference between house flipping and wholesaling. Wholesaling is when you are getting the property under contract and you are assigning your rights to that contract to another person, call that person an investor, and you are going to get a wholesale fee for that. So you are not going to fix it, you know, close on it, fix it up yourself, take on all that risk, go through all the headaches. You're not going to do any of that. You're, you're, you're just going to take it, put it under contract, and sell your rights to that contract to another investor who's probably going to flip the house or keep it as a rental. So benefits of wholesaling, um, less risk. You don't have, you do not have to put yourself out there and all that money to close on the house and flip it and hope it sells for something and hope construction goes really well. And you know, you don't have to deal with any of that, right? You just get a quick wholesale fee and you're off to the next transaction. So flipping is when you actually are closing on the property, you are fixing it up your, you know, with a contractor or whatever, or yourself, and you're putting it back on the market and you are selling it. Now, tune, on, tune in to HGTV and that's like all that's on HGTV, right? You're all those house flipping shows. That's what we're talking about, okay? Which one's better? It depends on your personality. So the creatives out there who love design, love house flipping, and that's me, all right? I love projects. I love doing deals. I love raising money. I, I like like all of that. And I love the design element of it. Like that gives me so much joy. It does not feel like work when I'm doing that. Um, but wholesaling to, to some people, they love that. They love that quick rush. They don't like the design. They don't want to deal with any headaches or anything like that. It's they just want to move the paper, make money, cash, you know, big checks and just move on to the next deal. So it's total like preference as far as which one's better. That's it. I love it. What a great explanation. Guys, thank you everyone that joined us today on this live Rhino Roundtable. We're going to do this once a month and it's going to be on a Saturday. We're going to keep keep you guys updated. Definitely going to keep bringing you value. We're going to try and get the other coaches on as well. But, you know, sometimes I just got to pinch myself at, at one time, you know, we already talked about not having the money to afford the mailings. At one time, I was working for the man. I was always told to be where to be, what to wear, what time to show up when I was in the military. And now I get to choose my own schedule. Literally, we were at the beach for a couple hours yesterday and then got to go to dinner or to lunch. And I don't say this braggadociously. I say this humbly. But if it wasn't for taking those risks in the beginning of putting the mail on my American Express and not knowing if the sellers would call, I would still be probably in the military somewhere, maybe deployed, maybe training in the field, still doing doing what I'm told to do, being somewhere every day that what, what time they tell me to be there, wearing what, what I've got to wear, having my hair cut a certain way. And, and maybe not everyone's jobs are that uh, uh, structured maybe, but here's the thing. If, if you're running on someone else's schedule, someone else's time, someone else's treadmill you're not doing what's best for your family so go out there and take some action today uh we all did it and i don't know about you chris and lauren but i'm sure so glad i took the risk just a few short years ago um and i appreciate everyone being on here you guys want to give another one away you want to do another rhino roadmap you want hey, to just Brent, throw another I one out there share, give i forgot to share this too right before we give before we give the last one away here um if anybody was interested in, I, I just, I had this down in my notes, but if anybody's interested in partnering with us on the EXP thing, if you just go to my name, chriscraddick.com, you can fill, fill out the form. We'll talk to you how to get everything done. And if you're in Brent's uh, land sharks or Lauren's virtual wholesaling or, or the uh, whole, whatever the, the new one is, uh, um, you just, just post that on <laughs> Rhino there. roadmap. Rhino roadmap. Yes. Post that on there and, and I'll get you set up so that you'll be in there, uh, you know, in, in that tribe with all of us as well, with a little special extra attention. So, yeah, that's it. But, yeah, go ahead, Brent. And I fully support EXP. I, I, I appreciate that, them so much because I had, a, I had a real estate license at one time. 
and they weren't too fond of wholesalers. They weren't too fond of me wholesaling. So I let the license go. I didn't need it. Now I see the changes happening on the wall, the writing on the wall. So I am definitely getting my licenses license back. Unfortunately, I have to go through the whole 60 something hour course, which sucks, but I'm going with EXP. Uh, so, and I'm glad to have, I'm Chris, I'm so glad you told me about it. Um, yeah, but brother. yeah, Lauren, you want to give another one away? Another Rhino roadmap? Yeah, let's do it. So what do they have to say? What? 101 wholesaling 101. How about now you have to say Rhino roadmap? <laughs> Rhino Roadmap. Yeah. yeah. You got to put in Rhino the Roadmap is... in the comments. No, no. Let's do something different. It's actually, you need to go to the Wholesaling Inc. Facebook page. It's a public forum. Join it and comment in there, Rhino Roadmap. So we're going to take everyone that, that uh, commented Wholesaling 101 on this one, as well as anybody that goes to the Facebook page. And you can double up. Feel free to double up. Go to the Wholesaling Inc. Facebook page. Put Rhino Roadmap on the Wholesaling Inc. Facebook page, and we're going to have two different drawings and pull a name out of it, and you guys are going to be the very first two to go through the brand new Wholesaling Inc. or Wholesaling 101 course that's going to be called Rhino Roadmap. And if it changes again, the name changes again, I'm wrong once again. I'm used to it. But just <laughs> go out there and take some action, guys. Any final words, guys? Bye. See you later, guys. Enjoy yeah. your weekend. Kick butt. See y'all. See you next time.